And we are in God's house this morning to praise his name. God has been good to us. And I believe since he's been good to us, we need to let him know this morning just by telling him, thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day thus far. Let us all stand this morning as we share in our congregation a reading. As we do so, let us be mindful of the fact that, that as we read the word of God, I pray that the word of God will find our hearts. And as they find our hearts, I pray that we will be do, we, we, uh, we will be doers of the word and not just hearers thereof. The word of God coming from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6, it reads, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Amen. Let us join in with our women, and let us have a glorious time praising our Lord.
sisters in Christ. At this time, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our guests. So if you are visiting with us, would you please stand and remain standing until I have shared a word of welcome with you. Praise the Lord. We are so glad that God led you to come and worship with us on today. We ask that something will be said or done that will encourage you throughout this week. And we um, ask that a member seated next to you will extend a handshake of love and fellowship. We also want you to continue standing because we have something that we would like to give you. On behalf of Pastor Mac, the entire Cathedral of Faith family, and especially the Women of Purpose, we thank you for coming and we ask that you come again. Good morning once again. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for being here. Amen, amen. We'd like that you take your bulletins out right now. There's some very important announcement that we would definitely want you to keep in mind, especially those uh, announcements about the uh, school supplies, the donation, and the dates they will be giving away uh, supplies. So if you have a need for some children or uh, you know somebody that has a need for that. It would be very important for you to pay attention to those dates. Also, the single ministry uh, is going to be having their uh, conference coming up uh, the 18th through the 20th. So let's please be mindful of that. Uh, our family and friends day coming up. Let's start preparing that we might invite uh, the community, invite family and friends to come. We always have a good time in the Lord, so please be mindful of that. Are there any birthdays? Uh, this month. If this month is your birthday, won't you stand right now that we may acknowledge you if you have a birthday this month. Amen. 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 How about any anniversaries? This is the month of your anniversary. Amen. Amen. How we thank God this morning for that. Is there anyone here this morning who has finished orientation and would like to receive the right hand of fellowship? If you're here this morning, won't you come down that we may introduce you to the church family, that you finish orientation. Okay, amen. Everybody members, amen. Let's prepare now to worship God with our tithes and our offerings.
You came 
church say amen. At this time, maybe we prepare ourselves for prayer as we make it forward. Those of you that would like to, to come to the altar, we want to keep in mind those who are going through bereavement. So why don't we come now before the altar? Glad to see our minister of music back in town, Brother Damien Drain. Amen. We want to keep Sister Marcy Houston's stepdad pass. That, that funeral was held Saturday. Let's keep that family in prayer. Brother Leslie Simpson's mother passed. Sister Audrey Thompson, that's going to be held this Saturday, coming 11 a.m. at the Antioch Baptist Church. Brother Ryan, Arlene's brother, and brother and sister Earl uh, Dabner's grandson, Audrey Arline, on Maury serves will be on Saturday, August the 5th, 11 a.m. at the communal, community funeral home. Also, there are special prayers being asked for Sister Melissa Strout, Sister Linda Scott, Sister Margaret Harris, and Sister Mabel Garrett. They were asking that we pray for them. I see Sister Meadows and her family here today. Their mother has been uh, placed in hospice, so let's please keep that family in prayer. Amen? We want to pray for them like we will pray for ourselves. Go to ask that Reverend Antoine will come and pray for us this morning. Also, let's be praying for our preacher for today, Reverend Lorenzo Carr. Let's pray that Lord would use him in a mighty way to bless our hearts. Amen. Oh, I am standing. Oh, standing. I am standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. I am standing. Oh, I stand. I am standing on the promises of God. Oh, if you know it, say it with me. Come on. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, it is again the God that we pause right now first by just saying thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you have done thus far. Thank you, Lord God, how you have kept us. Thank you, Lord God, for bringing us thus far. Thank you, Lord God, that we are still standing, dear God. Some people have counted us out. Some people have said that we would not have made it. Some people have tried to take us out but lord god by your divine grace we are still standing and so father we know that it is not by our ability but by your divine might dear god you have kept us you have wrapped your loving arms around us and you have sustained us and brought us thus far lord god we ask that you would touch each and every family member dear god in the hour of bereavement oh dear god i ask that you would strengthen them on each and every side Every mother desire is that a family would stay together. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would just keep those families together. Strengthen them, dear God, right now, that they will lean one on another. Oh, dear God, that that love would go from heart to heart and from breast to breast. Oh, Lord God, touch them in a special way that they might encourage one another and love one another and just lift each other up. Oh, dear God, touch in a special way, dear God, that we will keep them in prayer. Keep them lifted before you, dear God, because we know that you will bring them through. We pray for our pastor in his absence, dear God. We pray for the Cathedral of Faith Church family, dear God. You know what each individual is going through. 
You know the circumstances and the situations in which you're dealing with. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch our children, dear God, our grandchildren. Touch those, dear God, that are dealing with addictions, dear God. Touch in the mighty name of Jesus right now. Oh, dear God, some mother's child, some mother's son, some mother's daughter is astray right now. Oh, but dear God, by your divine grace, keep them in your keeping power. Protect them from hurt, harm, and danger. And Lord God, at the appointed time, bring them back, not only home, but bring them back into the household of faith one more time. Lord, we promise in the end, dear God, to give you all praises and glory. Because the reality is you've been good to us. Oh, Lord God, you've been good to us. And for that, we just say thank you. We love you. We adore you. We magnify and bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I hear you, Chief. Good morning. First of obedience to God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to my pastor in his absence. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to stand before you, my brothers and sisters in Christ to proclaim God's truth as revealed in this holy word. I would be remiss if I didn't thank my mother for being here this morning, to my beautiful wife, Sister Carr, and our son Kalen, and our daughter Camille for giving me my space this week. Um, they asked me, uh, what do you need, Daddy? Daddy needs nothing. My wife, like, what can we do for you? I'm good. I'm good. So they just gave me my space. But most importantly, they gave me their prayers. And I thank them for that this morning. We won't be long this morning. I promise you that. So when a benediction is given, everyone in this building can attend the Sunday school class of his or her choice. And the church said, amen, amen. amen. So no further ado, there is a word from God this morning, if you don't mind standing. We'll come from the book of Romans this morning, the book of Romans, the first chapter. Book of Romans, chapter one, and we're going to look at one verse, verse one, Romans one, chapter one, and it reads, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. I want to read that one more time, and I want to look at that word servant as it's translated in the original Greek. It reads as such, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes from the following word. One word. Slave. You may be seated. Slave. Why is that word so controversial? When you look at this word in the original Greek, that word is doulos. And for some reason, of the 124 times this word doulos is used in the original Greek text, it's only translated correctly once in the King James. Why is this word slave so controversial in this day and age? Why did the translators deliberately mistranslate this word? Where well, there are several schools of thought and I subscribe to the one that maybe because this word slave stirs up emotions in people, strong emotions in people. This word, for some reason, especially in the African-American community, brings up 
some bittersweet memories. We look at our ancestors for over 400 years in this country were subjected to some very cruel things, physical and emotional abuse. So maybe that's why the translators didn't want to put the true word in here. They used the word servant in some translations. They used the word bond servant. But truth be told, the definition of a slave, simply put, the definition of the word slave is a person who is under the domination of an influence or person. Again, a slave is a person who is under the domination of an influence or person. Now, we don't like to think of ourselves as being under the dominion of an influence or a person, especially our young people, because that simply tells us that we're not in control. But I'm here to tell you, you are under the influence of someone or something. As a matter of fact, most of you right now have a little master on you. It's in your purse or it's in your pocket. I'm going to pull my little master out right now. Cell phone. We don't want to think of it as our master, but the cell phone is our master. With this cell phone, it tells us when to get up because we set our alarms on our cell phones. It tells us what we're going to wear today because we check the weather on our cell phones. It also tells us who our friends are and who our friends are not. You don't believe me? You let one of these sisters leave out of this building this morning and have another sister come up to her, not trying to be messy, but just come up to her and say, child, you should see what sister so-and-so wrote about your dress on Facebook today. First thing that sister's going to do, she's going to pull out that cell phone. She's going to go to her Facebook page. She's going to look at that comment. She's going to say, what? The next thing she's going to do, uh, unfriend her. So we have a slave. We are being influenced each and every day. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in this passage of Scripture. Now you have to keep in mind in first century Rome that slaves played a very important part in their economy. Some estimates give us that in the Roman society during the first century AD that over 12 million people were slaves. 20% of the population, one in every five individuals in Rome was a slave. And they didn't discriminate. They were male, they were female. They were all ethnicities. They were young, they were old, but they were crucial to the economy in Rome during this time. So when the Apostle Paul opened this letter and said, Paul, a slave, it didn't startle them because it was something that they saw each and every day. It was something that they were accustomed to. So this is what Paul is saying in this passage of scripture today. And we're just going to look at a couple words real quick. And you notice what he says, Paul, a slave, a slave. When they read this, it wouldn't have made them any difference. They were familiar with this word. But Paul was talking about a different type of slave, a slave that was indentured. He had a choice. He could work his way out. And if you go to the Old Testament, you look in Exodus chapter 21, you look at verses 5 and 6, this is the type of slave he was talking about. He was talking about the type of slave that when it was all said and done, and this master gave him the opportunity to go free, he said, no. I love you, master. I love my wife. I love my kids. So I'm going to stay with you. And there was a ceremony they did before God. And once they completed that ceremony, he was that man's slave for life. And that's what Paul was telling the Roman church, that he was a slave, that he was a slave to Christ. He was a slave to the divine master who saved him from a life of sin and death. 
and that he also said in that same passage, because you have to keep in mind, when you wrote a letter, you gave your name, you named the recipients of your letter, and you gave a salutation. And he told the Roman church that he came and he was called as an apostle. An apostle is simply one that is set, one that is sent with delegated authority. And he had authority. His authority was given to him from God, God alone, but men also recognized his authority. And he was set apart. He was set apart to give the good news of God that centered on his son, Jesus Christ. Now, when we say set apart, some people think you should be gone. You're off to yourself. You're always spending your time in prayer with God. But what good are you? You're so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. And that's what the Pharisees did. And Paul made it known that I'm not that type of person. I can work. I had a skill. I was a tent maker. And he built tents to support himself and his friends. And he wasn't too good to mingle with everyone. And I repeat that. He wasn't too good where he could not mingle with everyone. You know, some of us, when we get saved, we only want to hang with the saved folks. But what good is that if we don't go out and we talk to those who are lost on our jobs, in our homes, in our neighborhoods? Don't be so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. And that's what Paul was telling them. God had been so good to me that I have to share this news. And that's what he did. If you go back to Acts chapter 26, Paul stood before King Agrippa and he gave a powerful testimony to King Agrippa. And he told him about his life. I want to call it his BC life. He told King Agrippa how he was born. He was born into a very good family. He was taught by the best. He knew all the rabbinic law. He knew the scriptures. And like so many Jews at that time, he had heard about this man named Jesus, who was claiming to be the Messiah. And he was going to take care of this man because he knew that wasn't true. So he went about persecuting the Christians. He even killed some. You may remember a man named Stephen, who they stoned to death. He gave the casting vote. Kill him. Matter of fact, let me hold your coats while you stone him. He did that. So he heard about this church in Damascus, and he wanted to go and do what he was so good at doing, putting Christians in prison, killing, killing Christians along the way. And they gave him the papers that he needed. So he and his boys went along that road to Damascus, and something dramatic happened. A bright light hit them, and he fell to the ground, not off a horse, to the ground. And he heard this voice telling, you know, it's hard to kick against a gold. And he knew what that phrase meant. That meant you was opposing that deity. And he said, in abject fear, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one who you persecuted. So he was terrified and shattered at the same time. All that knowledge, all that education, he thought he was doing God's will, but in all actuality, he was persecuting the church. And he was shattered. So he humbled Paul. He blind Paul. He said, you go spend a couple days over here. And during that time, right then and there, Paul's life was changed. Saul gave his life to Christ, and with the same vigor that he attacked the church, that he killed Christians, that he put Christians in prison, he now took that same zeal, and he went to those same synagogues. He went to those same communities to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And when word got around about what Saul, who is now Paul, is doing, even some of the apostles said, Saul, you sure? You want him to talk? You know what he's doing to the church, Lord? But God said, no, this is my servant. We're going to equip him to do what he needs to do. And that's what he told King Agrippa. He was so convincing in his testimony that King Agrippa said, you almost had me. You almost had me. But see, Paul loved sharing his testimony. And we as believers, we should be the same way. When the opportunity presents itself, we shouldn't hesitate to share our testimony. 
because that person you're talking to, you may be the one that leads them to Christ. But we don't like to talk like that. We think that's Pastor Max's responsibility. We think that's Reverend Letman's responsibility. We think that's Reverend Wilson's responsibility. But we've all been called, and we all have a ministry. And that's why Paul was one of the greater evangelists to live and walk this face of the earth, because he wasn't afraid to share his testimony. And see, when you share your testimony, you have to talk about your BC life. And that's a saying that our young people have nowadays. You know, our young people say, when you're doing something or you're trying to live a life that you're really not equipped for, the young people say, you ain't about that life. Paul realized on that Damascus Road that he wasn't about that B.C. life. And B.C. simply means before Christ. He thought what he was doing before Christ was what he was called to do, but it wasn't. God had greater works for him. And when Saul talked about that B.C. life before King Agrippa, he didn't hesitate. He told him, I was wrong. He humbled himself. He admitted to others that I made a mistake. The things that I were doing were contrary to God. But God be the glory, he didn't give up on me. He knocked me down on Damascus Road before I did something that I couldn't return from. And that's what we have to do, church. This man over here sitting to my left, that we're blessed to have a lot of assistant pastor here, Reverend Letman, when he's given an opportunity to stand behind his pulpit, he loves to tell us about his B.C. life, his before Christ life, and he lets us know it all. He even goes as far as to give us his B.C. life name, Ice Man. Ice, ice, baby. Ice Man coming. I don't know where we get all that from. It must be a still a thing, but nevertheless... He doesn't mind sharing that with us. And you know, if you're a born-again believer, you have a B.C. life, too. I have a B.C. life. Am I proud of it? I'm really not proud of it. Back in my college days, my B.C. name was Low. L-O. And it wasn't because of all the good I was doing. I went to Angelo State in San Angelo, Texas. Dry County, which means for some of you young people, you couldn't buy beer or liquor in the city limits. So we worked, we went to school, we studied hard. And every Friday at 12 o'clock, like a time, like a horn went off. Choo, choo. Here we go. Low. What time we're making that ride, low? Because we had to leave San Angelo to go get what we needed to get. Low, what we getting this week? We getting the beer, low? Yeah, we're going to get some beer this week, low, because we're going to the house parties this weekend. Low, what we getting this weekend? We're going to get the hard liquor because we're going to the clubs this weekend. So I was quick as low to leave my brothers and some of my sisters down the wrong path. And the only time that BC Life Low led them to church was the Sunday before semester exams. Church was packed. They had to pull out extra chairs that Sunday because every brother and every sister went to church that Sunday and there I go the night before drunk sometimes didn't know how I got home to my dorm but I thank God for a praying mother but as I stood in that church on those Sundays I had the nerve to stand before God and say Lord it's low I mean it's, it's your son you know, we got some crucial exams coming up this week. Oh, if you could just bring back some of that knowledge, bring it to my remembrance. I sure would appreciate it. And he never failed me. So we have to share our story about our BC life because people need to know we're not super Christians. We make mistakes along this walk. But thank God that he forgives us. And that's what it's about when you're a slave. You're not under your control no more. Somebody else is controlling you. And for the believer, that's nobody but Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. He leads, guides, and he directs us. And that's what we need to be about each and every day. Isn't it amazing how God uses different people from different walks of life to control us? You look at Saul, all the dirt he did. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. 
God can use anybody, even an educated fool. And that's what he did with Paul. So we have to realize, isn't that powerful? How God used Paul. And I love how God uses people, Rev. He blinded Saul so that Paul could see. And we have to realize he can do that for you, just like he did that for me. And before I take my seat, because I told you it wasn't going to be long today, there's a young man back in 1748. His name was John Newton. He was like most of us, a young man. His mother taught him about Christ, but his mother passed when he was at the age of seven. And he went to his father, and his father was very successful in the shipbuilding business. And before his father passed, he taught him the tools, he taught him the trades, and then he gave him to another man who taught him. And he became captain of his own ship, and he was very successful. His cargo, you might ask, was human cargo. He delivered slaves. And in 1748, after dropping off a load of slaves, he was coming back, he encountered a very, very tumultuous storm. And as he was steering through that storm, he felt he wasn't going to make it. He felt the ship was going to perish, and everyone on that ship would perish too. So in the midst of that storm, he just simply yelled out, Lord, have mercy upon us. And God brought John through that storm. And in his journal, he wrote that he felt that God was talking to him through that storm. And a few years later, he became a minister. And he wrote some beautiful hymnals. And one of those songs that he wrote has become a classic in the church today. And I remember that first verse, which is so powerful. And it simply said, as John Newton wrote it, and I get ready to take my seat. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found blind, but now I see. And if you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you too can become like Saul, who is now Paul. You too can become like John Newton. And you can become like slaved by grace. God bless you. Amen. Grace. Ow. Ah. Oh, I found. Oh, I once was blind. But, but right now. Lord, I see While uh, the musicians are playing a song As our deacon councils or preachers are standing They're standing because of the fact that we're trying to Change somebody's life today On the heels of that word, I believe As he stated, Reverend Carr stated That all of us was once a low was well, once an ice, was an ice man, a tea, a dog. Somebody in here knows about being something that you were once called. But because of God's amazing grace, because God's amazing grace, now we are called something different. We're called by our given names. We're called by our heavenly names. So if you're here today and you still in your BC time, why don't you change that to your AC time? 